So at the retreat, we talked a great deal about loving kindness, about uh, being of benefit to all sentient beings. We talked about compassion. And so when we speak about bodhicitta, we are also speaking about compassion. But there is an element that is implied in teachings about the bodhicitta that may not be understood if we are simply talking about compassion in the way that Westerners talk about compassion. The way that Westerners talk about compassion is to think that compassion is a trait, like a character trait, that one must establish or build up as though it were not there already, and one were simply building it up in the same way that uh, one would collect coins or um, let's say if one were to really like teapots, uh, one might collect teapots. And um, in collecting teapots, uh, you might learn a great deal about the different kinds of teapots in the world. Uh, but that isn't the proper approach to the bodhicitta, really. We should not consider that bodhicitta is a quality that we must master or collect or um, produce as if we were producing the bodhicitta out of nothing. Here a deeper understanding is called for. So what I would like to refer you to as a way to deepen the understanding is that you might notice, let's see, I don't know that we have any right here, but there are pictures in our collection of tankas, those are the religious pictures, where you will see Lama and consort in union, or you will see the meditational deity and the Dakini in union, like that. You will see them together. When we first come to the temple, perhaps we are confused about what that means, and we wonder, <laughs> how weird are these people? <laughs> and what am I going to find out a few months down the line? <laughs> this could be very strange. <coughs> But I'd like to explain to you the meaning of these pictures, or at least one meaning of these pictures, and how it connects with the understanding of the bodhicitta. In many ways, you can consider your own nature to be something like the sun, in the sense, now, of course, that there is at some point the analogy falls apart, because one's nature is simply indescribable. It is without uh, contrivance. It is completely natural and spacious and openly aware and any time that we try to conceptualize the nature in any way, shape, manner or form at some point the analogy will fall apart because what we are describing is absolute. What we are describing is literally beyond description and cannot hold the description. Conceptualization simply cannot be held by that which is so primordial, so fundamental, as to be the intrinsically natural state. But let's use this analogy temporarily. Uh, let's describe the bodhicitta as being, uh, describe our nature, I should say more clearly, as being like the sun in that, at least according to our view, there is never a time that we can understand the sun began and then the sun, sun ends. To us, in our perception, the sun, the sun simply is. It, it, it does not turn off and come on. It does not vary itself. Uh, perhaps there was a time in our development when we thought the sun moved away, went to sleep, and then came back later on. But we've since found out that, in fact, and here's a way that the analogy works very well, it isn't the sun that changes at all. The sun simply remains and it is actually our perspective that turns its face, that turns away. So essentially the analogy works when we consider that it is that way with our nature as well. There seemingly is no beginning and no end, no point at which we can determine there is a variation in, in our nature the nature simply is. Where there is never a time the nature turns off. There is never, never a time that it 
reasserts itself, it simply is. And then carrying that analogy even farther, farther, when we consider the primordial wisdom nature to be the fundamental primordial ground of being, then we should consider that that being the case, if we consider the analogy of the sun, the sun also has sun's rays. It has the rays of the sun, which may not be as easily understood. They don't appear to us like a round ball. And yet, science knows, we all know, by virtue of the fact that there is life on this planet, that there is a tremendous energy in the sun's rays. Perhaps earlier on in our evolution, we could not determine what that energy was. And yet, we could see that in the sun, we would feel much warmer than in the shade that even when it's cold outside, we can gather some warmth from being in the sun. We can feel that. And we've noticed ourselves that places where the sun uh, isn't able to get to, such as, I don't know, in a cave or under a great ledge or something like that, it's very difficult for life to flourish. It's very difficult for most forms of life to flourish. And so the ones that do are simply the, the very hardiest kinds that have adapted. So we've we determined from that that the sun has tremendous energy. And yet when we look at the sun, we can't actually see that. And we think, oh, the sun is over there, way far away. And so what, I what is the connection? Our understanding is very limited. Well, the bodhicitta in many ways is like the sun's rays. It really isn't possible to determine, other than conceptually, where it is or how it is that the energy that the sun provides for us actually leaves the sun and becomes the sun's rays. In many ways, this energy is indistinguishable. It is inseparable. Perhaps one can try to conceive of energy that is separate from the sun's ball itself. And yet, in truth, there is no actual ending of one thing and beginning of the other. In the same way that the sun continues to be present and simply remains, just as the primordial wisdom nature simply remains in its natural state, the sun's rays also are continually pouring forth. The sun can no more take back its rays than it can stop shining. The sun's rays continually produce energy, even energy that affects our furthest planets. Perhaps not in the same way as it affects our planet or the closer planets, but it affects even the furthest planets to the degree that these planets revolve around the sun. So why am I using this analogy? To, un to help us all to understand an answer to a question that many practitioners have about the bodhicitta and about their understanding of the bodhicitta. We must understand that like the sun, our nature is the primordial wisdom ground of being that is free of contrivance, free of separation, free of conceptualization, free of that which defines subject and object, that nature which is our primordial wisdom nature simply is. That nature cannot be constructed. In other words, if it were possible for you not to have within you the primordial wisdom Buddha nature, you could not make one if there were not one already there. This is a silly way to phrase it. And, and when you're speaking about something that actually is free of any kind of contrivance, really any words that you use to describe it will be useless. But still, you must understand that when we consider the primordial wisdom nature, we consider that ground of being to be empty of self-nature so that there, there is no thing, nothing, which can be described as something which stops and goes. 
that nature is completely free of contrivance, completely free of that kind of delusion, the delusion that is born of separation or the belief in self, belief in self nature as being inherently real. Now, the bodhicitta is that which spontaneously emanates, spontaneously arises, spontaneously displays as, you know, from and as the ground of being in emanation form. The bodhicitta is as inseparable from the primordial ground of being as the sun's rays are from the sun. The bodhicitta as well is as much a part of the sun as, as, as much a part of our nature as the sun's rays are a part of the sun. And in the truest sense, in the most profound sense, we have to consider the bodhicitta to be indivisible, inseparable from the primordial ground of being that is our nature. Simply stated, one is the primordial, natural, empty state. The other is the primordial, natural display of emptiness. So even the bodhicitta, while we think, and here's what students have been saying to me, while we think that we have difficulty developing our compassion, that's only because of an incorrect assumption on our part. It's only because of confusion that we may have. <coughs> no one has the problem of being unable to develop their bodhicitta. No one has that problem. Um, the students that have come to me and said to me, well, you know, I'm really attracted to the teaching. I would really like to practice as you, as you have described. It really makes sense to me. You know, I'd like to be helpful to others, but to tell you the truth, I don't get the whole compassion thing. I don't seem to have much bodhicitta. So I have to really start from scratch I have to really create the bodhicitta. How can I possibly do that? And um, first of all, what I have to say to you at that point is if, if that were true, go home, have a nice, nice life, give it up. Because you can't create bodhicitta where, where there is no bodhicitta. That is simply not possible, at least not with what we have to work with in samsara. So Lord Buddha's assumption, Lord's, Lord Buddha's teaching, that each and every sentient being has within them the primordial Buddha seed, that Buddha seed which is the ground of being, is an indication that both it is not possible to create that nature, to create that bodhicitta if it were not already present. And secondarily, it is also implied by this teaching that it is not possible to destroy or lose or ruin the primordial state that is our nature, it is not possible to destroy the bodhicitta that is the display of our nature. Well, you ask yourself, why, how is that possible when you definitely can name a few people who aren't very kind, who don't seem to have any great compassion? And you wonder maybe if, in their case, <coughs> something truly amiss might have happened. <laughs> and uh, uh, I'm sure you can name many people that you have questions about. <coughs> However, even for them, even for the meanest, lowest creature in the six realms of cyclic existence, even for someone that is maybe on a human level, a terrible criminal, you know, that really does horrible things to people. Even, even they have within them the ground of being that is their nature. That inherent Buddha seed, <clears throat> which in its display form is the bodhicitta. 
Why does one act so much different than the other? Primarily because of habitual tendency. Primarily because of karmic patterns and habitual tendency. Now what is karma? Karma is one of those words that if you like it, you really, really like it and probably abuse it and use it badly. <laughs> if you don't like it because everybody's been throwing it around for so long and uh, you think, what is it, chocolate karma, instant karma, you know. <laughs> you just begin to wonder whether karma is not one of those be-all, end-all things like where the medical profession says, virus. <laughs> It must be a virus. <laughs> so it, it's kind of like that. But in fact, that inherent Buddha seed that is our nature in its display form, if we were to look with pure view as the Buddhas look, every activity that we engage in, every thought, every sphere of reality that we are involved in, in their true nature, in their essence, this is all the display of the bodhicitta. However, from our point of view, we have difficulty seeing that. Now, what does the Buddha, Buddha teach us about this? The Buddha teaches us that the reason why we have such difficulty seeing this is because of the assumption of self-nature as being inherently real and the resultant hope and fear that come from that assumption. Assuming self-nature to be inher inherently real, it must be so then because self by definition is separate from other. So if self-nature is inherently real, there must be other. If we are to have the capability to perceive other, we have to perceive other with either hope, fear, or neutrality. Reaction is a natural occurrence once we consider self-nature to be in re inherently real and separate from other. We have to react because we have to determine self and define self by thinking, how does self feel about other? So essentially, reaction toward other becomes something like a survival mechanism or a mechanism that we use to constantly reassert self-nature as real. So that being the case, while, while we are asserting self-nature as being, in, being real and spending all of our time really in a compulsive deeply habituated, knee-jerk reaction towards other. And that's really all of our time is spent like that. You know, I react to you with hope. Maybe you'll make me happy. Maybe you'll give me money. Maybe you'll be my friend. Maybe you'll tell me you like me. And so I have hopes for you. Maybe you will make me feel happy because I am a self. This is how we think. <coughs> and then we also have fear. Because if I am a self and you are other, could be you're not going to like me. Could be I should protect myself from you. Could be you're going to hurt me. Could be uh, this is the first day of the last day of my life or something like that. <laughs> could be you are big trouble. So we have that kind of feeling as well. And if we've evaluated both sides, we may arrive at the idea of neutrality. Well, you know, I don't have too much hope about this. I don't have too much fear about this. So my, act my reaction is kind of neutral, but the neutrality is based on having swung back and forth from hope and fear first. The neutrality there, neutral reaction, is not truly neutral reaction. We never have neutral reaction. Neutral reaction takes place after we evaluate the hope and fear scenario. This is the condition of our response as ordinary sentient beings. Yet, in our nature, while all this seems to be happening, in our nature, we are the pure primordial ground of being 
in its natural state and all that we see is the display of that. In pure view, in the Buddha's eyes, all events are understood as a display of the primordial wisdom nature. Does that mean that there are no problems and we should sit, sit here and just go, everything is love and light, everything is love and light, na, 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 na. and we have no problems, and uh, the world is perfect, and nobody's suffering, and therefore we should just sit here and try to be happy? But no, no. not unless you want to be committed. I don't mean to the path either, I mean <laughs> put away. That is a very neurotic way to handle it, because what you're doing there is you're pretending. You're, you're pretending, rather than having pure view with the eyes truly open, you're pretending. My suggestion is, instead, we become aware or awaken to the equality of all that lives by virtue of the fact that all sentient beings have within them that unique and precious, non-manufacturable Buddha seed and that every display of that nature is the bodhicitta. So in a way, one of the goals that we have to practice on the path is to train our view. We actually train ourselves to perceive more purely, as though we would perceive if we were more awake, more aware of the conditionless condition that is our nature. So, slowly, slowly, through our efforts on the path, we try to grow in understanding and we, we use expressions like giving rise to the bodhicitta, awakening to the bodhicitta, um, practicing the spontaneous and effortless display of bodhicitta. Well, these are all ways that have been described in an Eastern culture. So for Westerners, it's very difficult for us to understand what in the world they're talking about. <coughs> what does that mean, give rise to the bodhicitta? To us, that means give rise like a high rise. You build it, <laughs> you know? Um, or you alter it in some profound way, like... Uh, if you wanted to give rise to a big balloon, you'd blow it up from a little thing, you know? So because of the way our words are structured, we think that we're creating something that isn't there. And so therefore, it is possible for a student to say, well, I don't have much bodhicitta. <coughs> now, according to the Buddhist teachings, that is a misconception. A pure misconception. Well, an impure misconception, I should say. So instead, as we are learning about the bodhicitta, as we learn about compassion, what, what is supposed to be happening there is our understanding about it should grow at the same time that we are accomplishing the practices. And in this way, in the same sense that smoky glass would be cleared so that the sun's rays could shine through, in that same way we are clearing the smoky glass of our inappropriate assumptions so that the sun's rays can shine through. But the sun's rays are not gone when there's a dirty window and back when there's a clean window. Do you see what I'm saying? There's no building or alteration or fundamental change that's actually happening. We are simply gathering the merit in our practice to be able to see for ourselves and have a more natural and direct experience of the primordial wisdom nature. We are removing obstacles to our own liberation and so in doing that more naturally this, the display of our bodhicitta becomes evident as we make progress. And when we think of ourselves as giving rise to the bodhicitta, 
we must not consider that we are creating something that does not exist. We must understand that we are practicing what is natural and appropriate. If it were possible to measure the nature, and of course, what would you put on the scale? This is not possible. You can't measure the nature. It's not like that. That is a concept. If it were possible to measure the nature, however, and if it were possible to measure, that, measure the nature in its emanation or display form, perhaps then we could think, oh, one person has more compassion than another. But that isn't possible. The Buddha taught very clearly about the equality of all that lives. And that equality is clearly not based on appearances. How can it be? We are short, tall, fat, skinny, black, white, brown, yellow, red, all kinds of colors. We have different color hair. We have different ways of talking. We live in different places. How can the equality of all that lives be based on appearances? It isn't. This is never what the Buddha taught. The Buddha never taught us to just have some kind of idea and replace a previous idea with that idea. The Buddha said, within each and every sentient being is that inherent Buddha nature. Without exception, from the smallest cockroach to the greatest king or queen. In our nature, we are identical. Therefore, in our capacity to give rise to the bodhicitta, we are also identical. So those of you who are wondering why it is so difficult to practice the bodhicitta in a consistent way will have to look somewhere else for the answer because it isn't in the fact that you don't have bodhicitta. <clears throat> bodhicitta should not be understood as anything that gross or heavy, um, anything that material. The bodhicitta should be understood simply as the primordial ground of being in its display or emanation form. Therefore, the logic of the Buddha's path holds true. Here now, the goal becomes to awaken to the primordial wisdom state, to, to begin to become aware of the natural ground of being, to relax concept conceptualization, to relax reaction, that is the hope and fear, to, react, to relax the constant revolving in desire. And those kinds of fundamental assumptions, particularly those involving the separation between self and other, to relax all those ideas, all those concepts to the degree that the mind becomes natural. The mind can remain in the natural state in a very spacious way, free of contrivance, simply resting as the primordial ground of being. So this is the goal in the Buddha Dharma. We do all these practices so that we can practice in that way. At the same time, we are practicing compassion and the idea of giving rise to compassion. But actually, the display of the bodhicitta becomes a reality. One actually gives rise to that display in a very clear and and. Uh, visible way when one clarifies the view to the degree that the mind becomes relaxed and free of neurotic contrivances. So in other words, the part of your neuroses that might be speaking to me saying, 
well, you know, I like the path, I love the path, this is good and you're cute, but I don't have any compassion. That's a neurosis. That's a neurotic statement. Uh, now, let's, 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 now this is not an insult. I'm not insulting you. This is the natural condition of samsara is that kind of neurosis. Because define neurosis, what is it? Neurosis is acting or conceptualizing in an inappropriate way when you consider what actually exists. It's inappropriate to your environment, inappropriate to what is. So that question then becomes inappropriate. If you were to awaken to your nature, if you were to sample or to be able to simply abide spontaneously in the naturally awakened state, that question would become that's a stupid question, basically. That's a neurotic question from that point of view. So our job now is to begin to practice in the way the Buddha has suggested, awakening slowly, slowly over time, gathering merit, increasing our generosity and our, and our concentration and our capacity through practice, clarifying our minds and liberating uh, some kind of capacity for true perception of that ground of being which is our nature. As that begins to occur, then naturally the bodhicitta is revealed. Naturally the bodhicitta is revealed. Literally the Buddha has taught that for those who have tasted the nature, for those who have awakened to the primordial wisdom nature, there is no decision to practice the bodhicitta. It is simply not possible to do anything else. Literally, everything that such an awakened one does will resent in what is, bene what is beneficial to beings, no matter what it looks like. And there are many amazing stories about the bodhisattvas that we have in our traditional teachings. Like the one amazing teaching about a bodhisattva who in his meditation was able to look down a cliff at a boat where there were, I think, 500 arhats about to go onto this boat and travel across the water. And uh, on that, arhats are like, um, sort of like um, practicing uh, realizers, to, uh, practicing to be Buddhas. So, <clears throat> so this bodhisattva was sitting on a cliff meditating and he realized that 500 arhats had gotten on this boat and they were to be transported across the water to the other side. And then he also noticed that someone else got on the boat and he could see in his meditation and his wisdom that this person was a criminal and that they intended to rob the arhats and in doing that probably would kill many of them that this person held weapons and was planning no good. So the Bodhisattva was filled with compassion, filled with compassion knowing that the Buddhist teaching is that if you harm an arhat or a practitioner or a member of the Sangha, you know, in, in any way, that the suffering that will befall the person who harms them is inconceivable so much greater than the suffering that would befall and that is harmed. And so this bodhisattva, in their compassion, rather than see that one person harm 500 arhats and suffer endless lifetimes and a lower rebirth because of that, the bodhisattva killed that criminal before he could harm the arhats. So there are many logical ways to think about that, and, and these are important things for us to consider. First of all, when we consider that all sentient beings are equal, when we believe in the equality of all that lives, then the welfare of one is simply not as important as the welfare of 500, number one. That's one piece of logic. And then also beyond that, if we practice as the Buddha has taught, cause and effect relationships cause us to understand that, you, that sentient beings suffer from the causes that they create. 
and any bodhisattva would wish to prevent the terrible suffering that, suffering that this person would accumulate by killing all of these holy arhats. So even while to some people it may seem shocking because in the West our idea of compassion looks like this. <laughs> it doesn't do anything, it doesn't really help anybody, but it looks like this. You know, we have this idea that to be compassionate is, is a way that you look or a, a way that you sound and all the words that you say. We don't understand the depth of compassion and that sometimes compassion doesn't look like compassion at all. Yet from the point of view of one who awakens to the nature, all contact that they have with all motherly sentient beings will be of benefit simply by virtue of the fact that the bodhicitta is the natural display of the precious awakened state. On the other hand, you might wonder, well, okay, in that case, why don't we just meditate and not worry about compassion at all? Because the Buddha also taught us that there are many different levels of compassion or bodhicitta and many different expressions of it. To name a couple, there is aspirational bodhicitta, and then there is actual bodhicitta. Aspirational bodhicitta is the stage of a practitioner's development where <coughs> <coughs> they really want to help people. They really want to help others. They have come naturally to that place in spiritual evolution where they feel that they would simply like to serve. And so perhaps uh, they just hold it in their mind. And I know that many of us have gone through periods in our practice when we have thought a great deal about how much we would like to be of benefit to others, how much we would like to contribute to the end of suffering in some way, how much we would like to make things better. So we have that aspiration. <laughs> <clears throat> and sometimes with that aspiration, a great deal of emotion happens. We think, oh, now I have really entered onto the spiritual path. I really, 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 really want to help people. I want to help people so much. I really want to help. I want to be a helper. And you kind of think on this very emotional kind of, I am going to save the world. It, it just borders on the, the, the uh, fanatical and messianic. <clears throat> so we've had that maybe really, really strong feeling, <clears throat> which has a strong emotional element. Then when we get down to actual practice, we find that we are contemplating thoughts that turn the mind, we are doing the practice, we are meditating, we are accumulating mantra. What happened to all that emotional wanting to help everybody? Here you are sitting on your little cushion for how many hours a day? You don't have time to help anybody. <laughs> and so you wonder how in the world this is going to happen. You used to aspire to give rise to the bodhicitta, but now, you, now all you have to do is you, you read all these prayers and, and where did that go? What happened there? So that's another thing that students mentioned to me is that it, before they felt very compassionate and now they don't. Well, that's because before they were feeling aspirational bodhicitta. But now they are actually giving rise to the bodhicitta. So the same emotional feedback is not there. When you are practicing and dedicating your practice to the liberation and salvation of all sentient beings, this is not just a blah, blah, blah thing you do. It actually benefits others. It actually, you know, for instance, if you pray as part of a nation, you are raising the merit of that nation every time you pray for the liberation and salvation of all sentient beings. If you are praying as part of a family, you are contributing to the raising of the uh, virtue of that family. 
So you are contributing a tremendous amount. But you don't have that same emotional satisfaction of feeling high on love. <laughs> You're actually sitting there in your practice, and you have to sit in that position, and you have to visualize, and you have to read those stupid words, which I, to this day none of us can pronounce. And, and it's just <laughs> concentrate on that, get the rhythm right. And, for, and not only that, but there's a tune to it. I mean, it's just, so you're sitting there, and you're trying to practice all of that, and you're keeping this on, and you wonder, baby, baby, where did my love go? <laughs> you just got to wonder, because before you used to feel it, and now you're sitting down with fanny fatigue. <laughs> so one of them clearly is the aspirational bodhicitta, and the other is the the actual bodhicitta. You are actually engaging. You can't expect that same emotional response. It would not be appropriate. If you were still running around on your path like a, a cheerleader with pom-poms, you know, yay sentient beings, yay sentient <laughs> beings. <laughs> it's just not the same <laughs> as actually practicing the bodhicitta. So if you, if, you, if you undermine your own practice by expecting that same kind of wonderful, deeply satisfying love for all, forget it. It's not going to work that way. You must also understand that you're making room for something more profound because that hope that you had before, that aspirational bodhicitta, was much more superficial. You, the separated ego, were wanting to help them who were over there. So fundamentally, the delusion is still there. There is no awakening to the primordial state. We're simply having good thoughts. So again, we're trained to think that that's what feels good and that's what's right and appropriate. So we're hoping Gee, I hope I have an emotional experience soon. It's getting pretty dry around here. <laughs> I mean, the Christians, they still get to feel things. <laughs> All those Christmas carols and everything. And we have to sit there. Very difficult. So don't undermine your practice by getting yourself into that kind of position where you're afraid you've lost it or maybe never found it or whatever because you don't have this almost um, goody two-shoes angle to your aspirational bodhicitta because, you know, guess what? It's not about you. <laughs> Whoa, is that a flash? <laughs> I'll say this to you many times in your career as a Buddhist, and you won't hear any of them. <laughs> <coughs> so, then even beyond that, also, we have to maintain the idea of compassion and, and uh, uh, you know, encouraging ourselves to really perceive, and this is what the Buddha has taught, the terrible condition of sentient beings that are wandering endlessly in samsara, wishing to be happy, as we all do, but not knowing, know how, to not knowing how to create the conditions of happiness, what makes happiness. So that being the case, we train our minds, just like the Buddha said, to appreciate or to empathize, to understand the condition of all sentient beings then, you know, at the same time, we also have to engage in some kind of practice that contributes to the end of, of suffering. Because once we realize that all sentient beings, that all samsara, I should say, is pervaded with suffering, that all sentient beings suffer, and that 
while their suffering may be impermanent, so is their happiness. What, that everything is impermanent, that all sentient beings are simply revolving like a bee in a jar in this effort to be happy, but they're creating uncountable causes for unhappiness. So we, we have to train our minds in this kind of thought so that we can appreciate the condition of sentient beings so that we can pr appreciate you know, and center ourselves and be firm in our practice. Why should we practice? Because, because of what I've just said. Because there is no other way to understand how to create the condition of happiness for all beings and for oneself as well. Except by creating virtuous causes. So, these are things that we have to learn. And, and, and even with that, the Buddha teaches us that there is ordinary bodhicitta and there is extraordinary bodhicitta. The Buddha teaches us that ordinary bodhicitta can be practiced by anyone and it is the bodhisattva's responsibility to practice ordinary bodhicitta as well. So, ordinary bodhicitta is what? It's what you can accomplish in the world, basically. Ordinary bodhicitta is that benefit which results from gathering together the properties of the world and creating a superior condition of one sort or another. For instance, let's say if I were extremely wealthy and I had the capacity to feed everybody in India, or Africa, or whatever, you know, some country that maybe, some place that didn't have a lot of food. Let's say we could take, take this one place and we could feed everybody in it, no problem, from now until the time that each and every one of them die. So I've got the money, if you've got the time. Let's do this. Well, even though that would be an amazing, wouldn't that be an amazing thing? I mean, think about it. What if you could feed everybody hungry on a whole continent from now until they passed? I'd like to do that. And that would be my responsibility if it were possible for me to do that. Yet, that is only ordinary bodhicitta. It's only temporary bodhicitta. It's only ordinary bodhicitta because basically you are drawing on samsara to solve your problems and to contribute so what you're giving them is only ordinary food. Ordinary food can only feed their ordinary bodies and only till their ordinary bodies cease to function. So it's ordinary. The food is, it comes from samsara, therefore it can only result really in more samsara. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't feed the hungry. It means that you should understand the nature of the bodhicitta and give rise at every opportunity. Now, extraordinary bodhicitta is different. It's that which produces the result of liberation. You, and you have to wonder, what can you do that would produce the result of liberation for others? I mean, what could you possibly do that would really end suffering? What, what's possible here? Now, this is where the Buddha's teaching becomes precious and invaluable and becomes a lamp in what would otherwise be darkness. Because the Buddha teaches us that there is an end to suffering. And that end to suffering is called the precious awakening. So, that's all I had to hear. There is an end to suffering. Now, I'd like to see that end. And for those of us who have been training our minds, we are becoming aware more and more that we too would like to see the end of suffering for all sentient beings. Having examined samsara, its causes and its results, we see that there is too much suffering. 
And so we wish to see that suffering end. So we try to give rise to, in our practice, extraordinary bodhicitta. Now, again, this extraordinary bodhicitta is, can only be that which arises from a pure source in order to result in the precious awakening or liberation, it has to arise from the precious awakening or liberation. The seed has to be the same as the fruit. You can't get grapes from an apple seed. You can't get bananas from a peach seed. It just doesn't work that way. So if you wish to partici participate in the liberation and salvation of all sentient beings, then we need to practice extraordinary bodhicitta. And this extraordinary bodhicitta must come from that precious awakened state or from the mind of the Buddha, from the, from the Buddha nature, if it is to result in the Buddha nature or liberation. So here's where we find ourselves in our practice, learning how to do puja, learning how to accomplish the generation and completion stage practices sequentially and appropriately. And we're learning to do that at the same time we are learning to dedicate all of our virtue and merit that we have accumulated in the three times, past, present, and future, to the liberation and salvation of all sentient beings. Here we are beginning to practice extraordinary bodhicitta. We are actually dedicating our lives, transforming our lives into a vehicle by which all sentient beings would be benefited. We are practicing in order to accomplish supreme realization so that we ourselves can return in a Nirmanakaya Buddha form throughout time to benefit sentient beings, to lead them away from suffering. This is what we are practicing and this is extraordinary because this, this, this that I am describing arises from the mind and the capacity of the Buddha nature. Therefore, it will result in the capacity of the Buddha nature. And we are dedicating our lives to accomplishing that, this extraordinary thing. So there is the, the ordinary bodhicitta, and there is the extraordinary bodhicitta, there is aspirational bodhicitta, and there is practical bodhicitta. There are so many different ways to understand this which is not separate from you. Remember that when we talk about the bodhicitta and practicing the idea of bodhicitta and giving rise to compassion, these are words to describe a process. But it is incorrect to think that the bodhicitta is something that perhaps you have destroyed through non-virtue and now you must create or perhaps somehow you being the only dung heap in all the universe <laughs> are the sole sentient being born without it. And I know that some of you may think that but it's not the case. You have clearly as much compassion as any cockroach I know. <laughs> And I mean that in the kindest possible way. <laughs> I'm all sentient beings being equal. So the description that I've given you, I hope will empower you to take yourself by the hand and travel through this experience. There is, there's no to me, it is not even a consideration. There is no thought that we should have that if we sincerely apply ourselves to the practice of giving rise to the bodhicitta, that if we sincerely apply, apply ourselves to the practice of the Buddha Dharma, if we sincerely apply ourselves to the practice of making this world a better place, there is, there is no thought, there is no idea that we will not accomplish this. Because by creating the appropriate causes, we will have 
the appropriate result. So we should feel empowered to then create with confidence those causes. We are not creating a holiness or a compassionate nature that doesn't exist. We are simply awakening as the Buddha has taught us to be awake. We are simply demonstrating that which is true. That all that we see is in its nature a display of the primordial wisdom state. And so our tremendous opportunity now, while we may have conceived of compassion as being something different, and while we may think that it feels different to make compassion, these are all misconceptions, and you should not let them rob you of confidence in your practice. You should be confident that even though you may have made many mistakes earlier in your life, even though you may have done even many non-virtuous acts, I ask you for a moment to reflect on uh, the story of the wonderful Saint Milarepa. I mean, talk about a guy that turned a leaf. <laughs> this guy had some history. You know, he was a, a black magician and he actually harmed people. And uh, he was kind of a mess before he found his teacher and was completely transformed by that experience of connecting with his root teacher. And then suddenly his compassion became such that he was relentless in continuously practicing and dedicating that practice to the liberation of, and salvation of all sentient beings. He was just relentless, and the stories about what he went through and his practice are just phenomenal. We can't even conceive of such a thing. And he did give rise to the bodhicitta. It is by his blessing that many of our practices and prayers have come to us. And so his, you know, his accomplishment was tremendous. And yet in the beginning, he was a real bad guy. So I suggest that we hold ourselves in that posture of Vajra courage, that we persevere, that we do not second guess ourselves or judge ourselves by trying to determine if, if it feels right. Do we have the right feeling? <laughs> because it's not like that. I mean, that would be like saying, let's see now, am I human today? Do, does it feel like I'm human today? Well, you're human every day, but some days you feel a little different. Some days other people think you're different. <laughs> it's like that with the bodhicitta. The bodhicitta is always there, but sometimes the feeling is different. So it would be as stupid to look in the mirror and say, am I still human? as it would be to try to determine if you've lost your bodhicitta. I don't know how many people said they lost their bodhicitta. Where? Where's it going to go? Well, hold on to it then. So I hope that this has been somewhat helpful in uh, refining some of the ideas that we have about the bodhicitta, particularly continued, continuing some of the effort that we have put into the retreat in this way, <coughs> we can understand that bodhicitta is a birthright and not something that we hope we can make or buy someday or that maybe someone outside will bestow upon us. If we wait for any of these things, we will never see the end of suffering. Instead, we should understand that this is our nature and we should proceed with Vajra courage, confident that we will be able to contribute and not determining because we feel one way or another whether or not we are successful in our practice. It isn't like that. It simply requires continuing. No, no.